C4, are we good? Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the City of Topeka Planning Mission meeting. We are a commission appointed by the mayor and city council to plan for the orderly growth and development of the community, to hold public hearings and to make recommendations to the city council on the planning items. Please note that the city council rules state that the public, he public hearings for planning cases shall be conducted solely by the planning commission. No additional public hearings will be conducted by the city council. Tonight's cases are tentatively scheduled to be may be found at speaker.org. First, the planning department staff will summarize the case. Next, we will hear from the applicant or the representative, then we will receive public testimony. Public comments should be addressed solely to the chair and are limited to four minutes. Chris, please take roll. Mr. Armstrong is not present tonight. Mr. Dean? Here. Mr. Freed? Here. Ms. Heron is not available this evening. Mr. Kennar? Here. Mr. Kalp? Here. Ms. Messina? Here. Ms. Ringler? Here. And Mr. Warner? Here. We have five for, or seven for a quorum. Approval of the minutes from the August 16th meeting. Are there any um, offers for corrections or changes? Not seeing that, I would entertain a motion to approve the August 16 minutes. This Commissioner Kennard would move for approval of the minutes. This is Corey Dean, I second. You please uh, take a vote, please, Chris. Okay, Mr. Dean. Aye. Mr. Freed. Aye. Mr. Kennar. Aye. Mr. Kelp. Abstain. Ms. Messina. Aye. Ms. Wrangler. Abstain. And Mr. Warner. Aye. Motion passes 5-0 with two abstaining. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is item C, declaration of conflict of interest or export state communications by members of the commission. Declaration. Uh, not seeing any, then we'll move on to item D, which is the action items. Uh, first item is the public hearing on item Z21-07 by Brian Thompson uh, regarding uh, zoning change from R1 single family district to I1 light industrial district. Uh, Mr. Hall, is that yours? Yes, this is mine. Go ahead and advance the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a proposal for a change in zoning from single family district to Iowa and Light Industrial District. It's 7.3 acres located east of Southeast Deer, Deer Creek Parkway on the south side of Southeast 10th Street. The applicant intends to develop the site for a contractor office with a shop and a storage yard. Staff is recommending approval of the zoning change. Next slide. As you can see, the land surrounding on at least three sides is zoned R1. There is a bit of I1 zoning to the west. There's a single family residence that is abutting the property on the southwest corner of the site, and that residence appears to be unoccupied. There's a there's a gate around the site. Uh, there's a or excuse me, a fence I should say, uh, a gate that's, that has a chain and a lock on it, and there's a portable toilet sitting out in front of the garage. 
Next slide, please. This gives you some context. It's kind of a large area, kind of hard to comprehend without some more cues and landmarks. As you can see, uh, Reesers is located to the west. It's close to the uh, Deer Creek Parkway interchange and the uh, Rice Road interchange with I-70. Forest Park Retreat, if you're not familiar with that, that's a uh, facility owned by the Methodist Church. They use for conferences, meetings, retreats, that kind of thing. Then the State Women's Prison is located to the uh, to the northeast of the site. A lot of the land around the, the property is vacant, uh, undeveloped in any way, uh, and covered with a lot of uh, trees, a lot of natural landscape. Next slide. So on the future land use map in the land use and growth management plan, the property is designated for industrial land use. Next slide. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of this, it's in an area that is is kind of in the path of, of more industrial development. Uh, it's planned for industrial land use. Uh, it, it's not likely that the area around it's going to be developed as residential, single family residential, although uh, the zoning surrounding it is, is uh, residential. And for those reasons and for others, uh, staff is recommending approval. Uh, the applicant did conduct a neighbor information meeting. Uh, Mark Boyd is here representing the applicant and uh, no one attended that meeting. No, no one, uh, none of the neighbors or any other stakeholders attended that meeting. And so uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Are there any questions for staff? Not seeing that anybody is uh, uh, having any questions. So this time we would invite the owner or the representative, I believe you said is Mr. Boyd. So Mr. Boyd, if you would like to uh, present at this time. Okay, well, good evening, commissioners. Um, I am Mark Boyd with SBB Engineering. Uh, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Brian Thompson. Um, <clears throat> this is about as uh, zoning matters as I think it can get. So I really don't have anything to add to the staff report. Uh, just here to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? For Mr. Boyd, uh, I'm not seeing any. All right, thank you, Mr. Boyd. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. Um, we have now uh, opened the uh, public hearing. Is there anyone here that wishes to uh, address this issue? A matter, a member of the public. I'm not seeing anyone. It would appear that there was no one here to uh, speak out in the public. So at this time, I will close the public hearing. Um, and then are there uh, any further questions from uh, any of the commissioners uh, for either the planning staff or Mr. Boyd? Or any other comments regarding the uh, proposal? I would entertain a motion uh, regarding uh, this item. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, move to recommend approval of the rezoning from R1 single family to uh, I1 light industrial. I would second. We have a second. Warner. Yeah, Commissioner Warner, second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Chris, would you take the vote, please? We'll go from the bottom up. Mr. Warner? Aye. Ms. Ringler? Aye. Ms. Messina? Aye. Mr. Kell? Aye. Mr. Kanar? Aye. Mr. Freed? And Mr. Dean. 
Aye. Okay, motion passes 7 0. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. All right, uh, next item is item B2, uh, public hearing, uh, PUD 2102. Uh, Fairvan Scooters Coffee Kiosk, rezoning from an R2 single family dwelling district to a PUD planned unit development district for C1 commercial uses plus food and beverage kiosk drive up window. Um, and who is the staff members at? Uh, Mr. Hall, are you presenting again? I'll be presenting this. Yes, thank you. So if you can advance to the next slide, please. So this, the property is located on the northwest corner of uh, Topeka Boulevard and St. John Street in North Topeka. It's about seven tenths of an acre. The zoning change being requested is from R2 single family residential to PUD with C1 uses, plus food and beverage kiosk with drive up and walk up service. So the C1 zoning district allows restaurants but it does not allow drive up services the drive it this is the use is primarily about drive up service uh, and so that requires a higher zoning than c1 uh, and that's the reason for this being a pud uh, the pud is is a way to restrict restrict uh development that's not C1, like C2 zoning, but it also allowed the drive up. The, and I'll go into this in a bit, in a bit but the uh, neighborhood plan supports uh, a neighborhood commercial land use at this location. Uh, so the a walk up service is a way to develop this use in this, this land while providing a service to the neighborhood rather than just being a, like a regional or community wide type of service. The other thing about this PUD is, is it's a PUD without a master plan. Uh, the zoning code allows the- I'm the only one not hearing anything. I can hear. I can hear okay. I can hear him. Should I proceed or should, should uh, I wait for a few minutes, Chris? Commissioner Boyd or uh, Commissioner Freed, are you hearing him now? Um, I guess go ahead and let's we'll see. Uh, Mike, this is, this is Bill. I, I would, um, I've, I've let Mr. Free know about his instability with his audio that may have something to do with it. And so at this point, until he has that fixed, I don't know that he'll be able to hear us and we may not be able to hear him all, at all times. So, um, I would go ahead. I would proceed. And if he uh, is unable to, or if we're unable to communicate properly, we can designate someone uh, kind of to, to fill in um, and run the meeting if needed. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the zoning code allows the planning commission and governing body to approve a PUD zoning uh, without a master plan, provided the the uh, issues can be adequately addressed with conditions that are attached to the ordinance. And so you don't see this type of thing very often, but that's the, the, the case with this particular application. Staff is recommending approval. Next slide, please. This is just a photo of the site uh, viewed from the Southeast corner looking Northwest. Next slide. So this is a site plan, the latest uh, version provided by the applicant. Uh, 
And I, it's an anticipated site plan because it still would need to go through a site plan review process. Uh, the, the PUD, if approved as recommended, does not tie specifically to this site plan. However, the conditions of the PUD are such that this site plan would be consistent with those conditions from what I can tell. One thing that's uh, notable about the site plan is you can see the drive up window on the so north north is facing to the to the left in this in this particular on this particular slide. So on the south side of the building, that's the drive up window on the north side of the building is the walk up window with a, an ample area of outdoor seating and parking is on the north side as well. So what's key to this site plan is, is the uh, outdoor seating area and walk-up window uh, and, and pretty good pedestrian access. This hasn't been fully vetted for, for pedestrian access, but uh, some of the things that were talked about uh, prior to the uh, application in the pre-application meeting uh, regarding access, vehicular access, this appears to be consistent with that. Uh, one of the things that will have to happen is uh, the applicant before or, or with the site plan application will have to provide a traffic impact analysis to look at the, the capacity of the, of the drive-through operation to accommodate traffic safely. One thing, else, one thing uh, also about this, this uh, site plan is uh, there's an ample landscape setback on, on uh, all three sides. Uh, not including Topeka Boulevard, although to the minimum landscape setback on Topeka Boulevard by code is five feet from the property line, and and uh, hit, this site plan is showing seven. Next slide, please. So here's the zoning map. Uh, as far as land use and zoning, there's single family residential zoning and land use on three sides. Uh, the area transitions from C3 zoning and use car lot at the southeast corner of the intersection. So that's what makes this a transition area PUD. The site is not really well suited for single family residential land use at is surround, at is, as it is surrounded on three sides by streets, including Topeka Boulevard, which carries quite a lot of traffic. And the current zoning allows commercial uses of high intensity uh, such as auto sales, excuse me, that's a typo. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not, disregard that last sentence in that, on that slide. Thank you. Go to the next slide, please. So the proposed zoning is consistent with the neighborhood plan. As mentioned before, there's a condition that requires food and beverage kiosks to include walk up or dine in. The PUD conditions as recommended also require a traffic study, limits signage and prescribes landscape setbacks. The applicant's anticipated site plan responds to the input of neighbors who attended the neighborhood meeting. The applicant did conduct an in-person neighborhood meeting. There were two people that, that uh, attended and uh, they made comments at the meeting and uh, Randy Fair, the applicant, uh, responded to those in his site plan. Next slide, please. And that concludes staff's uh, presentation. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions of staff? Uh, this, yeah, this commissioner, please. Dean. Um, I was curious, Mike. There's a pretty good section of uh, open land to the south. Is that will that be? Um, is that intended just to be landscaped, or is that going to be future development, or could there be future development with this being a PUD? Mr. Dean, uh, my understanding is, is there's no intent to develop that for anything but landscaping, just a landscape setback, uh, and uh, I suppose. Theoretically, under uh, the zoning as proposed, if if there's another use that can fit on that site with and meet the landscaping requirements and parking requirements, I suppose that could happen. 
but uh, that's not the intent. And the applicant can respond to that question as well when, when you're ready for that. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Cobb. Uh, Mike, a couple questions. Uh, on this slide that we have in front of us right now, uh, will it be possible to do a left turn exit onto Northwest Tra uh, Topeka Boulevard? Commissioner Kalb, uh, that would have to be analyzed as part of the traffic impact analysis. As far as I know, there's there was no uh, comment made by the by staff uh, pre-application that indicated that that would be restricted. It's something that could be considered, but it would be a technical matter uh, reviewed upon the traffic analysis of traffic. Okay, Mike, uh, the other question I have is, uh, and I understand why the applicant is going with the, uh, the lesser commercial uh, designation coupled with the PUD. That, that makes sense. And it's great to see some development on that lot. Uh, but I'm wondering, is there anything in the PUD that would restrict uh, or prohibit any alcohol or CMB sales? And I understand this is proposed to be a coffee, uh, you know, uh, dispense coffee, but uh, uh, if that property is sold to somebody else, the the uh, PUD runs with the land, doesn't it? It does. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, as proposed and as recommended, a drinking establishment's not permitted. Uh, liquor package liquor sales are not permitted under C one, and uh, I suppose there's a potential for. Uh, CMB to be allowed as an accessory use, but only as an accessory use. But, okay, so you understand you could, you could not sell either for on-premise or off-premise consumption with just the underlying C1 classification, correct? Correct. Let me explain something. Go but ahead. Under the, PUD, the PUD, if it's worded broadly enough, uh, what what would prevent uh, a future owner from uh, having either packaged liquor or uh, CMB sales at that location? So I, th I see where you're going with this. I, th I think you raise a good issue. You raise a good point because what the, the condition says as written is it says food and beverage sales. It doesn't say whether that's alcoholic or non-alcoholic. So I think you could, you know, if that was a concern, you could add a, add some text to that condition and, and say that beverage not including CMB or alcoholic beverages. Well, just, I'm just, just speaking for myself, but I, I think that would be, I would favor a, uh, an additional condition that would expressly prohibit either CMB or alcohol, either on-premise or off-premise. So let me explain something also. Uh, if, if this was just C1, uh, not, not the PUD, um, well, even as recommended right now, as proposed, uh, a restaurant's allowed in C1. A restaurant can sell alcohol, uh, CMB, as an accessory use in a C1 district. I don't know if you'd want to uh, write the condition to be so specific or to be so general as to prohibit uh, alcohol sales as an accessory use for a restaurant, for like a dine-in restaurant. In the event that this development doesn't happen, um, I think you would want C1 zoning, it'd be appropriate to have C1 zoning and C1 use is allowed. So, um, but, I, but I do believe there's a way to address your concern, Commissioner, uh, with how you write that condition. Well, if, if um, just one more question, Mike, if, um, if it is an, uh, an accessory use in the C1 zoning, uh, that, I, I was, that was not my understanding. So I, I don't, I guess I would withdraw my, my comment about the, uh, the sales. 
uh, and the C1 allows off-premise consumption as well. When you say when you say off-premise consumption, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, like a package package liquor or uh, Cor correct. Okay, yeah, so package, have... package liquor sales are not allowed in C1. Okay, so it'd just be on-premise consumption at the restaurant. Correct. And that would be both uh, CMB and 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 liquor. That's correct. Okay. So would there serve any purpose to have a a a, a condition attached that there would be no uh, no off-premise sales? No I think, sales of alcoholic liquor or CMB for consumption off premises. I, I think it would clarify matters if that was the case, because the way the condition is written, uh, let me see. It says a restaurant or beverage store or kiosk with drive through and walk in service. So I, I suppose what you could do is add after a restaurant or beverage store, not including sales of off prem or sales of uh, alcoholic beverages for off premise consumption you could add that in that condition okay and that is again that's, i'm just obviously speaking for myself but there is there are a lot of residential uses in the immediate vicinity and i i for one would favor a restriction from any um, sales for off premise consumption And that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kalp, and because uh, I'm not sure I'm clear, but in order to avoid using uh, uh, shorthand, you want to describe, since we're in a, a public discussion, what CMB is, please? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Could you repeat that, please? You were using the term CMB? Oh. Well, I, I, I think it's still a, a, a current uh, uh, acronym for cereal malt beverages. It is. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then uh, we have a representative. Is that Mr. Fair? Correct. Uh, my name, thank you. My name is Randy Fair. I'm actually one of the owners of uh, the Fairvan Land Investments, which is what we use our limited liability company to own property um, with regard to our scooters locations. Uh, this is our, this would be our sixth, sixth store. Uh, we have two others in Topeka. Uh, we have one in Ogallala, Nebraska, one in Lexington, Nebraska, and one in York, Nebraska. Um, we don't sell alcohol. There's no plan for that. That's, um, we're covered by scooters uh, franchisor. So we're actually underneath their corporate. Um, we're just a franchisee and so we have to have uh, specific requirements on what we can do even with our property. Um, that property is not large enough to put something else on there. So your question on the Southern usage, uh, that was that model of um, layout was changed to accommodate uh, and to make sure we got along with the neighbors, specifically um, Reverend Dan David McGinnis at Harlan Worship Center. Um, I did talk to him. He was at the meeting. I did talk to him after that. I've sent him some emails to make sure he's uh, understands what we're going to do. Uh, as they're doing a major renovation in October, and we always want to make sure we're good neighbors with everybody. That's our that's our focus uh, with regard to that. So the plan is is to develop that and be fully landscaped, get rid of that um, all the concrete in that area, and hopefully make it match. If you go south of there, right across the street, there's that's actually a designated park area has a park bench there. Um, that would be our plan, just so we have a good relationship with the the church because I guess they get they get pretty busy on uh, Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and Sunday days from talking to uh, the reverend um, there so uh, alcohol other sales not allowed um, we're restricted the only thing we can sell is scooters copy products uh, and that is our plan normally we have to have a minimum 10-year uh, obligation with scooters so uh, we would actually allow our, our scooters company to come in and basically build the building and then they would uh, have to sign a 10 year lease with us to satisfy the requirements of um, scooters coffee, our corporate 
uh, organization there. So if that answers your questions, if you have other questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cobb. Just a quick, Mr. Fair, I'm sure you understand that the concern is not about what you're proposing to do to the property, but if if uh, you decide to sell it on in five years to me, and I decide that the uh, the location is great for a for a liquor store or something, then that's that's what the concern is. Is uh, everybody likes coffee, you know? Um, I do. Uh, but but uh, liquor sales are appropriate in some locations and not others. So, and sure. I, I, really, I really appreciate the, uh, the the possibility of development of that lot. It's it's long overdue. Yeah, it, it took us quite. It took me quite a bit of uh, phone calls and um, inquiries to finally get the actual owners to respond to that location, just because of the history of of the company that owns it. Um, and so we have a contingent purchase agreement that's contingent upon obviously the city approving the the zoning change and us being able to build on it to our to our satisfaction. So thank you. So Mr. Fair, you you don't have any objection to a a condition that would restrict um, the, the off-premise consumption of or sales for off-premise consumption of CMB and alcohol, right? Not, not at all. Not at all. And and there's no and we wouldn't develop that property the south. It's too small and that would impact our ability to have people on our property. And we don't we don't want that. We try to keep everybody off of the stuff that we develop. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? For Mr. Fair. All right. I'm not seeing any. Um, we now open the public hearing for anyone who would wish to speak on this matter. I don't know that we have anyone from the public on, but is there anyone who wishes to speak? Not seeing anyone, I will declare the public hearing closed. Uh, any of the commissioners have any further questions of staff or Mr. Fair or any comments on the proposal? Not seeing any, I would then entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Dean. Based on the findings, analysis, and staff report, I remove to recommend to the governing body approval of the rezoning from R2 single family dwelling district to PUD planned unit development C1 commercial plus food and beverage kiosk with drive up and walk up window service on property located at 1409 Northwest Topeka Boulevard subject to the conditions as recommended in the staff report. I'll second. second. Commissioner Messina. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Chris, could you take uh, the Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. I'm sorry, I, I would like to offer a friendly amendment if it's okay to the party making the, commissioner making the motion and the second it, to the conceptual motion uh, for staff to add to the conditions, uh, the restriction on uh, sales of CMB and alcoholic liquor for off-premise consumption, consistent with the discussion we've had uh, this evening. Mr. Dean, are you okay with that amendment? Fine. Uh, Ms. Messina, are you still okay with your second with that amendment? Sure, yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, with that, then, uh, Chris, with the uh, uh, call for vote of the motion uh, with, as amended. Mr. Dean. Aye. Mr. Freed. Aye. Mr. Kanar. Aye. Mr. Kell. Aye. Ms. Messina. Aye. Ms. Wrangler. Aye. And Mr. Warner. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you all. If you don't need me for anything else, um, I look forward to working for you with you. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item is action item D3, public hearing of CPA 2101 by the city of Topeka. And who is the presenter on that? That'll be me, Mr. Chair. Okay, go ahead, sir. 
All right, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see that presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is CPA 21-01 Valley Park Neighborhood Plan. Um, we will get started on that. This is a follow-up. We were we came to Planning Commission in August with kind of an introduction, but we now have a little bit more information. So we will be proceeding with that. Uh, SORT is Stages of Resource Targeting. It's a three-year process that provides infrastructure and housing investment into a specific neighborhood. Uh, this was the Valley Park neighborhood. Um, with this, we developed a new neighborhood plan. We have kind of a timeline there as well. So 2021 neighborhood plan. 2022, the engineers will kind of put this into the project design phase. And then hopefully in 2023 or late 2022, we will begin implementation. For that year one process, um, we started off in March with our kickoff meeting. It was virtual. We had nine members of the community attend. Uh, from April to July, we held regular planning committee meetings with members of Valley Park. And then we had our final neighborhood wide meeting on September 8th. At this uh, meeting, we presented infrastructure projects and members of the community voted to approve the neighborhood plan and those infrastructure projects we will touch base on later. Um, Looking at the neighborhood itself, it is roughly 195 acres. It has boundaries of Southwest 21st Street to the north, Randolph Avenue to the west. And I apologize, I'm not sure why that is changing. Randolph Avenue to the west, Shunga Drive to the south, and Washburn Avenue to the east. Uh, some of the plan highlights for some of the highlights of the neighborhood plan were um, for the first time in, since 2007, the neighborhood returned to a healthy health rating uh, within the plan. We kind of build off of some of those key points to try and provide the structure to keep the neighborhood at a healthy health rating. Um, much of the housing conditions were found to be in sound condition. And with the plan, we promote home ownership and investment in single family housing. The target area is built on this theme, and we focus the infrastructure and housing funds in those target areas, primarily outside the floodplain to maximize those dollars. Um, a tr transitional land use was identified along Southwest 21st Street to accommodate any potential uses that may develop there. We'll touch base on that on the next slide. And then another big highlight was with the floodway and floodplain that impacts the neighborhood, we developed a section of the plan that talks about developing in the floodplain and some of the challenges that would be faced if someone decided to do that. Additionally, we had an appendix that had some resources from FEMA that talk about ways to prepare your home in the event of a flood or how to protect against um, some flood damages, as well as providing resources for who provides that uh, flood insurance. Uh, the intent there was to kind of make sure that members of the community had that information available so they could have a good rate. This is something that was talked about pretty regularly throughout our meetings. This is that future land use map. Um, the character of the neighborhood is primarily single family. The two changes you can see highlighted in green, that strip was changed from commercial to a medium density residential to potentially accommodate some duplexes as it transitions into that single family nature. Um, and then along 21st Street, there is kind of that hatch strip. That is the transition zone. And the intent of this is with all of the activity along 21st Street and specifically on the north side of 21st, if someone were to come in and want to develop something at a higher density in some of those single family residential homes, we can ensure that there are some guidelines to make sure it uh, respects the character of the neighborhood. Target area selection. So building off of uh, the premise of SORT, we have three target areas that were identified. Projects were, are intended to be implemented based upon that prioritization. So one, the farthest west is the primary, two is the secondary, and three is that tertiary target area. Um, we tried to get as much of as many properties outside of the floodplain as possible so that those housing dollars that uh, owner occupancy and rental rehab program can be maximized. And getting into those projects, what we have here are is the projects that were accepted by the neighborhood. Uh, there are 13 total projects. Um, they managed to get into all three target areas. We worked with engineering to develop these plans as well as what was in the SORT application, and then what we heard from neighbors 
during the uh, sort of planning process. So what we have are four new roadway projects, um, three mill and overlay projects, three seal projects, and then three sidewalk or pedestrian projects. The main thing with the pedestrian and sidewalk projects were to try and increase the access to Stout Elementary so that we have kids that are able to access the school on sidewalks or at least be able to travel to 21st Street. And on this slide, we have kind of the uh, financials of these projects. So we came in just under that $1.7 million in funds. Um, again, the housing dollars will be invested in, the, in those three target areas as well. Um, but these are what those costs are for the projects. And then building upon that, we didn't want to just have projects that we could accomplish. We wanted to make sure that there were some that were available to the neighborhood if they were to pursue additional funding from the city. Um, so these were some projects that we thought would be important to the neighborhood based upon what we heard from engineering and from the neighborhood. Um, we'll get into the financials of this as well but these are again, primarily pavement. Uh, sidewalk was not something that was as important. So we didn't really identify a lot of key points for sidewalks. And as we look at the breakdown of spending for these unfunded projects um, down at the bottom, so 21, 22, and 23, those are more of a generic line item that could incorporate some of those projects as a whole. Um, as you work your way down this list, you will see that some of these projects are have the same street in place. Again, that is if the neighborhood decides to pursue projects and they there's a smaller pool of money, they can try and get segments done at a time instead of doing one large project. Um, and then as we get to the bottom, so 21, 22, and 23. 21, the inlet replacement throughout the neighborhood. Um, the storm water inlets are something that this neighborhood has an older style of. It tends to get clogged or backed up with debris. Uh, they roughly cost five to ten thousand dollars to replace at a time. That would take some work on the neighborhood side to identify what they feel needs to be replaced, but there are definitely some that are available. So we included that line item. Um, additionally, curb and gutter, there's an older style there. This could be something that improves the aesthetic or helps the stormwater transition into those inlets more fluidly. So we included a line item there. Um, and then 500,000 for sidewalk installation throughout the neighborhood. Again, there's very little sidewalk that's in place. And if that's something the neighborhood feels should be prioritized later, having that item in place so they can pursue that funding seemed important. And then uh, that's all I have regarding the presentation. Uh, staff recommends approval of the Valley Park neighborhood plan as an element of the city's comprehensive plan. And then kind of our next steps, uh, the plan is available online at Topeka.org backslash planning backslash Valley Park. Uh, then this will go to city council for review. And then hopefully we have some project design and implementation in 2022 and 2023. And that is all I have and I will take any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the commission? All right, I am not seeing any. Um, I would open the public hearing. Uh, if there's anyone from the public who would wish to comment on the neighborhood plan. And I don't believe we have anyone from the public present. So I will, uh, not seeing anybody, I will close the public hearing. So at this point, are there any comments or questions from any of the commissioners regarding the neighborhood plan? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. It's, it's Mary. Hey, I just see that um, the president of the Valley Park NIA is, is on the Zoom meeting. Okay. Susan, do you wish to speak? Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, I thought that we did a great job on the um, plan and I hope that it can be approved. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm, I can available as well. Thank you, Mary. Um, any any questions? Okay, not seeing any. Um, uh, if there are no other questions or comments, I guess I'd entertain a motion as it relates to the neighborhood plan. I would recommend approval to the governing body as an element of the city's comprehensive plan. 
Second. Thank you. We have a mo was that the second, Mr. Cow? Yes. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Chris, could you uh, call for the vote, please? Mr. Dean. Aye. Mr. Freed. Aye. Mr. Kanar. Aye. Mr. Kelp. Aye. Ms. Messina. Aye. Ms. Ringler. Aye. And Mr. Warner. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. All right, that concludes the action items portion of the agenda. Next is item E, presentations of the neighborhood revitalization plan. Um, Mr. Feinander, I believe this is a repeat for me, is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we thought you really needed it a second time. So uh, Dan's gonna handle the uh, overview tonight. Uh, thanks for your patience. <laughs> All right, thank you. Share my screen. Okay, commissioners, um, relatively short presentation about the city's neighborhood revitalization program. <clears throat> uh, we're in the midst of an update of this program. It expires at the end of the year and I'll talk about what we're doing with this. So a little background first. Uh, so Topeka was the first city to adopt the neighborhood revitalization plan. It was authorized by state legislation in 1995. So Topeka's had that NRP, as we call it, since 1995. Um, the city's approved it eight times since 95, and we typically have 100% participation for from impacted uh, tax entities. So again, we go back to 95. So we've got all sorts of data now that we can use to evaluate the program. Um, so we've had 831 total applications since 95 and approved uh, 601 of those. There's been $464 million invested since 95, and this is both commercial and residential properties. We started tracking return on investment um, recently. And so we know uh, since, since 95, again, for every dollar, that's been rebated, um, $8, a little more than $8 has been invested. Uh, we've also started tracking uh, new tax revenue. <clears throat> so the rebate time period is 10 years. So if we had applications in 1995, they started coming off of the tax, ro tax rolls in 2006. So this is the information we're sharing now for new tax revenue is from 2006 to, to 21. So all taxing units have um, essentially received almost $30 million in new tax revenue and the city of Topeka is about $7 million. Oops. So the neighborhood revitalization program is based on Topeka's neighborhood health and the boundary for the program is, um, is based on the at-risk and intensive care neighborhoods. So you can see by this, slide here, 76% of the investments happened in their at-risk and intensive care neighborhoods. And we've created about 500 new residential units. If we look at downtown investments, so again, since 95, about $150 million that's been invested downtown. Uh, the average investment's about $5.5 million and about $83 million invested in historic properties. And the average is about $4.1 million. So I mentioned this already, but the boundary for the NRP is based on the city's at-risk and intensive care neighborhoods. Uh, we've recently, the planning department's recently updated the 2020 neighborhood health. So we've, we sync these up. So once we do neighborhood health, it's time to update the NRP. Uh, so the map is on the right there. It's the, the proposed boundary. Uh, there are a couple areas identified on that map that are coming out of the existing boundary. So we'd reduce the boundary about one square mile and the NRP boundary is about 21% of the city. Uh, so the next thing to talk about is rebates. So if someone improves their property and their appraised value increases 10% for residential or 20% for commercial, then they return that extra property tax caused by those improvements. So a real simple way to look at this you got $100, if you're paying $100 in 
uh, property taxes today, the improvements that you make to the property raises your taxes $100. So that $100 increment, that's eligible for the rebate. Uh, we have three re rebate types that we're proposing uh, with this update. So the standard, standard rebate, which has been around for a while, is 95% for five years and 50% for five years. The standard plus 10 is 95% for 10 years. And this applies to intensive care neighborhoods, historic properties, or infill housing. Uh, what's new in this update is a standard plus 20, which could add a, um, up to another 10 years to the, uh, to the rebate. Uh, this is, this is uh, eligible in a TIF district, uh, $10 million investment and must have housing. So uh, really for downtown. Um, ultimately, this requires governing body approval to add the years, add more years to the to the rebate. Uh, so next is but for tests. So we don't require a but for test. Um, we we feel like the this uh, but for tests are really baked into the the, the rebate. Uh, we already target the most investment challenged areas. So again, those intensive care, at risk areas. Uh, we require that application to be uh, submitted to us within 60 days of getting a building permit, and we have significant investment thresholds to be eligible. If we think back to that 10% for residential, properties aren't going to get there by replacing their fence or their roof. Um, what, what it usually takes to raise that value 10% is a square footage addition, so adding on to the property or building a new garage. Um, so what's new uh, for this for this program again? We do require a but for study for that standard plus twenty, and also for uh, buildings that are outside of the area. And speaking of that, so we, uh, which is really pretty exciting here. So the so per state law, the governing body can approve a dilapidated structure that's worthy of preservation that is outside of the NRP area. So we, by updating this plan, we're including the Menninger Tower in, the, in this plan and designating it as worthy of preservation and being outside the area. So um, if that gets approved, then the Menninger Tower will be eligible for the tax rebate. And then one final thing, uh, there's some funds within the Neighborhood Revitalization Fund, um, and we're transferring those to the Housing Trust Fund to be used as match. Um, it will target affordable housing, and it's about $240,000. So our next steps, so really we've met with all the taxing entities at this point. Uh, the next step is to go to the governing body for a public hearing, and hopefully they'll adopt the plan, and then we uh, get interlocal agreements signed by the end of the year with all the other taxing entities. And with that, that's, my, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments uh, regarding that plan? Mr. Chairman, just yes, Mr. Cobb. Uh, just one one quick question. If I uh, if I have a property that qualifies and is given a, a, a ten year rebate, um, and then my location is 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 moved out of the uh, boundary for the uh, for the NRP. Do I still get the balance of the years of the rebate? Yes, we honor that rebate until that 10 years is up. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? It's a, it's a great program and a, and a good presentation, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there... Uh, there doesn't seem to be any other comments on the uh, presentation on the neighborhood revitalization plan. So we go to item F, communications to the commission. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I have a couple uh, communications. Uh, the first is just to let you know uh, the case that you approved uh, back in August regarding the Wanamaker property going from office to C2 uh, was overturned by, or amended, I should say, by the governing body. Uh, they recommended a C4, uh, as, and they can do that if they have 
a super majority of votes. Uh, I just wanted you to know uh, that did happen at their last meeting. Um, their their main issue, or I guess main uh, concern uh, going into that was the try, trying to even the playing field, if you will, for the the uh, the applicants proposed use with other white competitors in the area in terms of signage. So um, uh, so they, they did do that. And if you recall, uh, the applicant had had recommend or had asked for C4 staff uh, and the planning commission supported a, a C2 recommendation. At the end of the day, and just we were able to provide some context on this, but at the end of the day, uh, from a sign perspective, the size of the sign will not differ between C2 and C4. What will differ is they could um, increase their height by another 10 feet. <clears throat> so uh, and it just depends if how much they set back. So I wanted you to know that um, there were some comments that they were thankful to staff and the planning commission to lean towards um, reinforcing the new sign code policy. Uh, they, they were thankful that we did that, but as is their uh, policy prerogative, uh, when these things come up, they, they did deviate uh, to the back to the C4 that was requested. Um, so that was that was the one update. The other uh, conditional use permit for the auto sales on on sixth and and Lawrence was was approved without comment. I and just uh, as a off note, I you know I don't I don't know that 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 changes to your recommendations um, is it's it, it's pretty rare. Uh, so this is not a uh, normal uh, uh, operation of of business, but uh, there is. I'd say in the times I've been here, there's there's uh, certainly less uh, than on. I can count on one hand the times that has happened, and uh, it's it's been a, it's been a few years since that occurred. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, my other communication is a sad, uh, I, I don't like these moments, but um, I also feel pretty, pretty blessed that we, we do get these moments because that means we've had some pretty special people with us for a while on the planning commission. We are saying goodbye tonight uh, to Commissioner Wrangler and Commissioner Armstrong, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Uh, these two have been with us, uh, been serving on the planning commission for, for six years. Did I get that right? Six years. And, uh, I, I, I am, I am extremely grateful uh, to their service. Uh, the, these are, and they kind of, they kind of fall along the same lines. Uh, I'll embarrass Katrina since she's here, uh, Brian, I've always al already tried to embarrass, uh, but they are, they both followed a path of learning, listening, uh, engaging, and then elevating to vice chair and then ultimately chair. Katrina was a chair for two years, I believe, um, and vice chair before that. Brian was was a vice chair for a couple of years and, and a chair for the last year and a half here. But that's not all that. And I thank them for their leadership on that. But but what really sets them apart with their service is the things they did outside of that role. Uh, and I really want to thank Katrina. Uh, she stepped in and helped us. She, uh, I'm sure she has no regrets on that sign code uh, committee. Uh, she also has, has stepped in to help us on some uh, interview panels and, and some other committees. Uh, on design and kind of using her expertise. And that's, that's just, we, we love that. I uh, love that about her. Uh, and, we're, and we love that she was able to contribute in, in that way. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, kind of the same way, his, his background in transportation, he really stepped into the MTPO role 
uh, and loved every minute of it. I, I know he's he's a uh, he's transportation uh, engineer to the core. So he really enjoyed that, and we'll miss him on that. We will miss both of them on this board. And I just I can't physically hand you your uh, certificate, but before uh, we off, we see if you have any uh, parting thoughts, uh, I want to at least read one of them. I'll read yours, Katrina, since uh, you are here. Uh, but they both, both, both say that presented by the city of Topeka on this 20th day of September in recognition of Katrina Ringler, uh, and Brian Armstrong for service to the city as a member of the Topeka Planning Commission. It has their dates of planning commissioners, uh, November 2015 to September 21. Uh, in Katrina's case, their vice chair dates, their chairperson dates, and it is signed by the mayor, uh, Michelle Della Isla. So uh, we'll be getting those out to you just as soon as, as we can. Uh, and with that, I will, uh, I will let, uh, let let Katrina have have parting thoughts if she has. I, them. Sure, I, just just real quick, I just wanted to say it's been a great opportunity. I really appreciate whoever threw my name in the in the hat, and because it never occurred to me to you know sign up for this, and somebody brought it up to me, and I was like, oh, I I can do that. Okay, um, and it's been it's been a great um, experience and, and I've really enjoyed working with everybody and those committees. Hey, I, I've enjoyed them. I, I don't know, you know, if somebody told me I would enjoy a signed committee, I probably would have said, are you sure? But it was actually really, really interesting. And if you need my help in the future for anything, please, please reach out. I, I, I'm here to, I probably will look for other opportunities to serve. So, um, I really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Well, th uh, again, thank you, Katrina and Brian. I forgot to mention that you you both will still revolve in in uh, our work world. Uh, so I'll get to see you probably with with other things, but uh, we will miss you uh, on these on these Monday nights for sure. All right. Well, you heard it here tonight, folks. Uh, someone enjoyed serving on the sign committee. <laughs> um, and with that, I don't think we take a vote on a motion to adjourn. Is that correct, Chris? On this, I have to keep in mind. So if there's nothing further, then uh, we declare meeting adjourned. And thank you, Katrina, for your service. Thank you all. Katrina. <laughs>